my name is Liara Vinson, and the title of my presentation is Targeting TRP Channels as a Therapeutic Approach to Chronic Pain. So what's the problem? Many people suffer from widespread pain, and something called nociceptor sensitization can cause widespread and prolonged pain. So this is often the, uh, the cause or the reason that people do suffer from widespread pain. So let's talk about what nociceptor sensitization is. Nociceptor sensitization is increased sensitivity to pain receptors within the body. What happens is when you have a repeated injury several times, um, it causes the production and the release of certain chemicals, um, chemical mediators rather, and that increases your sensitivity to thermal, mechanical, and chemical stimuli. So why is this relevant? Why is this important? This is important because there are several diseases that people suffer from. Some of them may be similar, some of them may not be, but sometimes what they all have in common is that the patient suffers chronic pain or uh, widespread pain. And so I think that it's really important to kind of focus on what we can do to reduce pain in general um, for people no matter what their situation is. The therapeutic options, now there are several therapeutic options. The ones that I would like to touch on today um, are dealing with targeting TRP channels, we'll talk about what that is in a little bit, chemotherapeutic methods, and neuro pro neurotoxic protein, excuse me, method. Um, so TRP channels, what are they? TRP stands for transient receptor potential, um, and these channels are activated by nociceptive neurons. The TRPV channel um, is what I'll talk about today, and the V stands for vanilloid, and that's one of the families um, associated with TRP channels. And then that family uh, breaks down into subfamilies, numbers one through six. And so I'm going to talk about TRPV1. So TRPV1 actually detects um, noxious physical and chemical stimuli. Keep in mind, TRP channels in general deal with pain. Um, and so this one specifically is very sensitive to high temperatures, pH changes, as well as um, the molecules that are released um, during tissue damage and inflammation. These are going to be the channels that we're looking at when we talk about um, repeated injury. They're the ones that are involved in the perception of pain. So if you can inhibit or slow down the activity of these channels, you can slow down and reduce pain and um, inflammation. And so they're activated by a number of agonists. So, and one agonist, for example, is capsaicin. Capsaicin is found in a um, number of peppers. Bell peppers, um, specifically, is one example. So let's talk about TRPV1. This article is entitled, On the Road to Relief. And it basically discusses how TRPV1 activation in nociceptors it triggers the release of chemicals that are received as pain. So once this channel is activated, neurotransmitters are released, and then you feel the pain. So the objective of this article was to give an overview of TRPV1, its clinical significance, and how it can be used to manage pain. Now the theory was is that TRPV1 can be used as a drug target um, to reduce pain. So several agonists and antagonists were mentioned in this article, and they actually yield a lot of inhibitory effects on the TRPV1 channels very successfully, and it leads to analgesia, which is reduced pain. And so I think the idea with this article and why I, one of the reasons why I promote this um, and TRPV1 targeting those channels is because it does give you the effect that you want. But there are a few discrepancies that I'd like to mention. So some of the antagonists actually cause severe side effects. One, for example, one of the research articles mentioned in this secondary, secondary article, excuse me, um, you had mice who experienced hypothermia after treatment with an antagonist. Um, also, capsaicin is, and I may have mentioned this before, capsaicin is one of the agonists to TRPV1. Um, and the issue is that, well, rather I'll say capsaicin, when it is in a large quantity or concentration, it actually inhibits TRPV1. However, sometimes it doesn't quite work out the way that they always want it to, and so every once and again, it doesn't really work. And so that's kind of a discrepancy because it's like it's, I don't want to say it's hit and miss, but it kind of is hit and miss. It may work or it may not work. Also, some of the agonists cause acute pain. 
Um, and I think capsaicin is the example of it. It works for some people, but it doesn't work um, for others. And so it kind of limits the use of it because not everybody can tolerate um, certain types of pain. And so in my opinion, um, I'd suggest future work that includes a combination of therapies, um, possibly reducing the concentration of certain compounds that will cause a negative side effect and increasing the concentration of another compound that doesn't have that same effect, possibly combining them um, as long as they don't work antagonistically against each other. Um, but it can be used combination therapy can be used. And so let's talk about targeting TRP channels. Several models have demonstrated um, successful inhibition of TRPV1. And so you have several examples and several cases where it did work um, and it reduced pain. Antagonists are actually capable of blocking many forms of TRP. So not just um, TRPV1, but TRPV1 subfamilies one through six, as well as other TRP channels. Um, and TRPV1 is expressed in a number of diseases, and so its application spreads wide. It doesn't um, necessarily limit you to a certain population of patients who suffer from one type of disease. Because it's expressed in so many diseases, and it's very active in so many diseases, um, and that's what this chart here shows, you can use it for a variety of patients. And that's why I do support um, targeting TRPV1 channels or TRP channels in general. Um, it, it is expressed in a number of diseases such as diabetes, cancer, asthma, and so it can be used for a number of um, patients and has a lot of applications as you can see. Now let's discuss the chemotherapeutic method. Um, this article is entitled In Vivo Anti-Inflammatory and Anti-Nociceptive Activities of the Extract and Chemical Constituents of an Endemic Turkish Plant, Salsola grandis. And so in this article, you have um, species or salsola species that actually provide a um, anti-analgesic and anti-nociceptive property. And so the objective with this article is to observe those properties in vivo in mice models um, and, and pain and inflammation in mice. And so the theory was that this um, organism, S. grandis, has in vivo anti-inflammatory and anti-nociceptive properties. And so they conducted two types of tests, the P-benzoquinone-induced nociception, as well as the carrageenan-induced um, paw edema. And so what they were able to do with this is measure the swelling of the hind paw of the mouse and compare it to the control group and quantify that um, to determine the anti-inflammatory effects. And they also um, measured the rhythm, which is the intestinal contractions, um, and kind of basically quantified the anti-nociceptive uh, properties. And so they found that two of the compounds that are found in S. grandis is four, um, compound four and compound seven. Um, we'll call it four and seven for short, but four is isoromentin 3 gluconamide and uh, seven is quercetin 3 o ramicide And they showed the most inhibitory activity. But there were a few discrepancies with this one as well. With um, ASA and endomethacin, they were the reference drugs. So that's what the um, different compounds of the plant, when they treated the mice with these different compounds, they compared it to the activity of the reference drug. And so um, when compared, four and seven compared to AASA um, and its inhibitory effects, uh, the numbers to me were uh, kind of different. And so with ASA at 52%, I wasn't really sure that um, compound four and seven at, in the 30 percent was really effective or as effective. Um, and so I felt like future experiments, they could try different concentrations of the compounds. You have the same quantity of ASA, which is the reference drug, um, and the other compounds found in the plant. You had those same ones use the same quantity, but um, maybe trying an increased uh, concentration of the drugs that are said to have an inhibitory effect maybe that would yield better results. Um, also, I have questions about the side effects. We noticed gastric lesions with um, the reference drug ASA, but we didn't notice any with the um, with compounds four and seven. So I felt like that was really great, but are there other side effects besides just the, the gastric lesions? And then not only that, how long will the effects of this plant last? So let's discuss neurotoxic protein. 
So this article's title is Selective Inhibition of Meningeal Nociceptors by Botulinum Neurotoxin Type A, um, Therapeutic Implications for Migraine and Other Pains. And so this article took a look at meningeal and other trigeminal nociceptors and how they play a role in migraine headaches. So really focused on migraine headaches. And the objective was to determine how botulinum neurotoxin A um, type A, excuse me, we'll call it BONTA for short, um, affects naive and sensitized meningeal nociceptors. And so the theory was that BONTA will inhibit meningeal nociceptors, um, another type of um, botulinum neurotoxin uh, has been working, has been clinically applied. And so um, it, since that was shown to work, it is expected that this will work as well. And so they use electrophysiological techniques um, using probes and electrodes to identify the meningeal nociceptors. And then they um, measured the spontaneous and evoked firing um, before and after the application of Bowen TA. And so basically they um, seen how, uh, how often um, it fired and how often the um, spontaneity of the electrical impulses were. And the less that you had, the greater the inhibitory effect. Um, and so Bowen TA actually acted on a number of channels, some of which may have been TRP. The issue is they don't really know what it acts on, as they don't really know a whole lot about migraine headaches either. And so with Bowen TA, um, the results show that it did selectively inhibit um, the C minus meningeal nociceptor, but not so much the A delta trigeminal meningeal uh, nociceptor. So you do see where it kind of works for one, but not quite the other. And that doesn't show um, quite the result I think that it could um, if we used a different type of therapeutic method. So let's talk about the discrepancies. It only inhibits one type of meningeal nociceptor as well as um, I wanted to know if Bowen TA, they used uh, four units of Bowen TA, and I wanted to know if an increased number of units would yield better results. Not to mention a future experiment, um, it should include other areas other than just the dura. It could include maybe the back or joints, other areas to see how else can Bowen TA be applied. And so in conclusion, targeting TRP channels seems to be the, um, the best way um, to go about fixing the problem of widespread and chronic pain. Um, the other methods, it's not that they didn't work, it just seemingly they didn't work as well. And although TRP does have its kinks with the side effects and some of the methods not working, there's still plenty of um, antagonists and other agonists that don't have negative side effects that do actually work and fully inhibit and get the results that we want. And so future studies, I think, could actually combine all three therapies um, that I mentioned here. And ch like I said before, change concentrations um, and try different areas. And I feel as though you could get better results um, with less side effects. Here are my references. Thank you for watching.